Do that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Greetings, Kerbinauts. I'm back from my vacation, and you can see that the vacation started off here, visiting the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, where they have this huge replica of the International Space Station down on the water, so that astronauts can go in there and practice all their maneuvers that they're going to do in the outside. And then we went and saw little versions of shuttles and the ISS, and went inside a big version version of the shuttle as well as going to the mission control center for the ISS. The last two stops were the rocket park and then we went over and looked at the actual visitor center and all the exhibits that they have in there. But let's go back to the beginning of the trip when we entered the neutral buoyancy lab and you can see a NASA Orion spacecraft down there and some modules and other different test trusses and stuff. But really, this is the good part. When you look out here from the catwalk that they allow visitors to go up into at any time, you can see that little yellow marker, that buoy in the middle. That indicates that trainees are actually in the water right now. You can see various modules down there. It's not all in one big piece. They can train on all of the pieces individually. You can see that gigantic truss down the middle there, and there's that yellow buoy showing exactly where the astronauts are training right now. As I continue down the hallway here, I get slightly different angles where now we can see the Quest airlock module and different modules. There's that Z1 with the gyroscopes up on top of it and the truss segments. I'm getting a little bit better look. And that's when I happened upon a map of it that let me see what all the modules were, in case I didn't already know, but it was pretty obvious what they all were just by looking at them. After having done Project Gateway, you can imagine that I kind of know what everything looks like when I'm looking at it. Also on the wall right around here was another little map showing what all the rooms were for the different instructors along the way uh, in that building on the far side. When the astronauts are all suited up, they're actually quite heavy on land, and so there's a crane that in a second here you're going to see, well there we go, they lower them down into the water on that crane that was just on the left side right there. Well, I'm nearing the end of the hallway now, and so as I'm getting closer, I take a moment to point the camera back down along the way and reflect upon all the images that were all along the walls all the way down. You can see there's the end of the hall right there. I come around the last one of the last corners, take another quick look out here at all the different parts, but then I'm in for a surprise when I turn the last corner. We move around here, and lo and behold, what do I see but a little control right there for where my daughter is currently manipulating a camera that's under the water that allows you to pan around and zoom in and all kinds of cool stuff and look at the module down in the water itself you could see the bottom of the airlock right there so if an astronaut were going in or out during training you'd actually be able to see them right there and then across the way are a bunch of guys in some red jumpsuits who are apparently working on helicopter escape techniques and then one last look right here at the underwater camera where this time I take control. I have my daughter holding up the camera at the television screen so that I can take control of the little handle there, that little joystick, maneuver it around to get a nice 360 degree view of everything. Looking at that airlock right there and moving along to the different truss segments and around. You can see all these different things. There's where the radiators would be right up there. And while doing that, I noticed that some divers are coming swimming along not sure exactly what's going on but I just kind of focus in on them to see if they'll do anything interesting they just end up passing by each other our guide Jason who was my host for this whole adventure and took me around to all the places said that they were working down below on a practice run for a camera replacement. Apparently, one of the cameras on the outside that we can actually access uh, here down on Earth. You can go to the websites and look at the cameras that they have out there, uh, but one of them has been pink for a while. I saw later when I was going through the Mission Control Center that it was pink as well. You'll see that a bit in the uh, episode. 
Anyway, as you can see here, they're maneuvering that camera up there with the assistance of the one diver to help uh, make it seem like it's in zero G because technically that would still sink, it's in water. While at the same time, I was telling my daughter what it might have been like to be there. That side he's going in would normally be pointing down at the planet because that's that side always faces the planet. So when you open up that that door right there, you actually would look like you have this like three a huge. I'll, I'll just describe it as huge. This huge fall all the time. It would look like you're you're coming out. And so basically, you're dangling. It would yes. look like you're dangling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no wetsuit. He's in swim trunks, so I'm assuming the water is yes. nice and toasty. It is. Somewhere around here, I threatened to put Jason, our host, into the actual episode here, as well as then uh, making our way back down the hallway where I got to look at more of those pictures that are on the walls that show all the stuff that they've done in the past. And then we were going to make our way over to the indoor ISS on the ground replica. But you do now have to take your uh, ISS module. Well, there you go. See, now you're in the it. Kerbal episode. You need to sink it off the Space Center and, uh, you know, do all this stuff. <laughs> oh, like build this in the game? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's the only put way it, to do it now. We can put it underwater. And that was it for that building. Our next stop was the ISS on the ground replica. I've turned on the camera as we walk through. We've just come in and I'm just panning it across everything I see. There's a whole bunch of different stations. The modules aren't all connected together exactly like the ISS. A lot of them are in separate parts, but there are several of them that are connected together. It allows the astronauts to go in there and practice things that they're going to be doing once they go up. And they don't really need everything exactly laid out uh, perfectly. Oh, here you can see my family, my son, my daughter on the left, my wife on the right, and Jason was up in the front leading us along the way. We pass by some of the stuff we're going to get to go into, like that space shuttle cabin that used to be used for actual shuttle training. We have to get authorization to go down because here I'm going to pan over, look up there, right up there. See that catwalk where people are looking from behind the glass? That's where real visitors have to go. And I say real, like in quotation marks, air quotes, because if you were just going to this place and saying, I want to go on a tour and get to see the ISS and all that, you would be up there behind the glass. Jason works here. He works at the Chrono Station that helps keep communications going between the ISS and the ground and that's why we're getting this very special behind the scenes look. Oh. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Do not I wash not for I wash use. All right. So, shuttle. At most you could have seven people in here. Um, and down here is where they would keep all their stuff. As I'm aware about it. And when we go up to the flight deck, they actually have an implement that they use um, during launch. Because uh, well, you'll see when you go up there, but basically there's whole panels of uh, switches. And they need to manipulate those during launch, possibly, so they need the some switch. way to reach behind them in their space. Close. Red. Red. This okay, way, stage two. Huh? <laughs> so these are not the right there. Um, yes. We've and got some switches. These things, you would actually have chairs here. This is where you would sit. Uh, Control the open. Four crew members would sit here. Is this shooting button? It's <laughs> not a shooting button. Hold, hold. <laughs> so if anyone would like to sit in the uh, two seats over there, go for it. Definitely, that is coming up for sure. <laughs> Have to Why are meals A, B, and C? Hmm? What's that? Why are meals A, B, and C? I believe those are going to be for oh, crew members. <laughs> crew members. Uh, so I know it's so, so like day two, meal C. Like meal C. <laughs> I'm flying. Oh. Slide into spot here. See, they're engineers, so they label their meals with letters. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, plus, I mean, you don't really And they get jammed into like this seat on right. liftoff. This right. is not a comfy this seat. Your day nights are oh, no. Right. Oh, I'm going to push my uh, name. Here's where they. Can do, I press uh, buttons? 
said. Yeah, yeah I believe so. Uh, so this is, Just don't lift off. This at one point <laughs> was a functional simulator with all the buttons connected. There's no but ass. Since we're no longer flying. Right, There's no ass. How dare they? And there's a bunch of different kinds of buttons, like for example, there's you know, auto switches, and then there's this one where you have to like pull it out. Yeah. Pretty cool. Oh jeez, uh, this, this is not very comfortable. <laughs> well, it's not designed for comfort. Is, no, no. It's designed to get you there and back in one piece. <laughs> yes. There's buttons up here. Anyway, shortly after this, we're going to slide back out through that door with the handy instructions on how to go through a door on the outside there. And then we're going to make our way along the outside. We eventually go around the entire building, all around the outside, and taking a look at some of the stuff that's going on in there. But now we're making our way back out of that shuttle and out onto the floor, that precious floor where very few visitors actually get to go down and look around. A test article that they would put racks in, and then they have the. You saw the big chains on the side. They would rotate yeah. the uh, module around and see how the racks behave. There's an actual spacesuit behind behind you. And now we're passing by. Well, stuff. Lots of stuff. There's so much to look at here. All these different things, radiators and modules and all this practice gear. I'm like a kid on a playground. Well, actually, no. A kid on a playground whose mom is saying you can't go out and play with all the toys because we have to stay back from all of these things. A fairly safe distance. At least it's a lot better than if I were up behind plexiglass on a catwalk, though. Jason said sometimes you actually get to go into them, but today they were doing some practice again uh, on some of the modules, and they didn't want any visitors going through while they're in the middle of their practice. We did get to see the shuttle, though, and now we're getting to go up and take a nice close look at a Soyuz capsule. This is how the uh, astronauts currently get to the space station. Ah. Three people, Cass. Mm -hmm. in there. That looks right cramped. There. That looks yes. like a baby right crib. Oh, my. Uh -huh. And the, uh, the seats are... Jason explained to us that the seats are actually custom molded to each astronaut who's going to ride in this. Here, just for scale, stand right next to it. He said they mold the seats that way because it makes it less likely that they'll do something like break their back when they land on the hard ground with just some retro thrusters to slow them down. Next up, we scale a few more stairs to go up to the upper module. Now, this is the part on one of those Soyuz where they could store little gear or have some extra space to move around in this section. I want to get inside. Oh, I hear you, daughter. I know what you're saying. I want to flip switches. Absolutely. Me too. Anyway, they could move around up in that section there. They would ditch that before re-entry. That whole section at the top and the propulsion section that would be down underneath would be ditched and only the middle part would be used for re-entry. Now while Jason is answering some questions for my family, I take a moment to just scan along the outside and look at everything. We also can look down from up here. It's a lot easier to see into the areas where they would actually be working whenever they're doing any training or anything. There's nobody down here. Well, well there's one guy down here right now, actually. But I mean, there isn't a whole training team. All the stations are empty right now because this isn't the part that they're actually doing anything significant with. All I can see is down in here with a whole bunch of the gear that they would use if they were doing any sort of training, all the computers and the wires and the headsets so that they can call in to the inside and simulate uh, communications with the ground. And now we're moving again, moving along the outside of these modules that I'm never able to get completely right for all of my Russian viewers. So this time, I'm not going to say them, someone else is. And if they get it wrong, you can yell at them. It's not my fault this time. We passed by the... Zvezda. ...module that helps control the space station's position. And we also passed by the... Zerya. 
module that was the first one ever to go up on Proton Rocket. I've launched that so many times now. I did it in Real Solar System. I did it in Project Gateway. I've done it uh, before Project Gateway in my prototypes and all that. Anyway, then we moved down into the American section where you saw we had some SpaceX stuff like a Dragon replica that they could practice in, different other modules, some international modules, all of that. And then we come around to the Japanese section on the far side. The camera just doesn't do justice to what it looks like to be standing here in person, gazing up at the size of these things when you're down here on the ground. I do my best to get the camera up there to look inside that little bit of it that I can see. I would love to go inside there, but alas, they are not open to the public right now. So instead, I just have to settle for that little view from the outside, just barely into that door. And then, of course, we're coming around back toward where we entered in the first place, which means we get to see the big scale version here up on the wall, just like what you would find really out on the Internet, though, if you go to the wiki page for the International Space Station, that's pretty much what you're going to see. And then like a recap of Project Gateway. Every single module, everything that was launched in order, shown here with all of the flags and all of the sequencing and what it looked like at all those points all along the way. It's like taking that trip back through memory lane on Project Gateway. I launched all of those over the course of 30 plus missions. And then even did two more real solar system launches. The one where I told you where I did the, well, we'll not make that girl come out and say the name again, but you remember the name and I don't want to get it wrong. And then after that, I launched the Unity module in a space shuttle, also in real solar system. If you haven't seen those and you like that sort of thing, go check them out. But for this trip on the ground version, we are now moving, like I said, back around to the front where we first came in. So we're almost done. And right here when we came in, there was a cupola that we hadn't seen. So I'm taking a look inside it now. It looks pretty awesome. Imagine being inside that thing and looking down on the earth. This is of course where all the robotics work would be done because they have the best view of the exterior from here. They can see down and out all around the station and down on the earth and to the docking stations. I think my daughter sums it up nicely here. Oh awesome! Oh, awesome. Sounds just about right, I think. So here we are. We're on the other side now of the Japanese sections. You could have seen there a moment ago the arm that's on the outside of that one. And then I scanned across where all they have all their monitors for if you were uh, training over in there. And just now I've seen the racks that they install all the extra hardware in. And they bring these racks up and they can install a certain number of them per module. As the years went on and the modules got bigger, the si number of racks, the size is always the same. It's a standard size rack. And the number of them increased. I think the Japanese module might have the most space for all these racks in there. Anyway, they bring up a science experiment and they put into them things like the life support which I just went by and there goes an Orion capsule and so you can see there that sometimes people can go up into and take a look at those here we have a gigantic uh, press basically it's a hydraulic press that simulates the pressures of a large craft like a space shuttle slamming into the docking port of the space station and they try to see how well it's going to withstand that impact and uh, test out that hardware right there. Okay, so next up, we're doubling back toward a rear exit of the building, where we're now going to pass by some things that were originally planned to be used on the moon. You can see robotic astronaut type guys and little spider things, crawlers. Coming up in a moment will be some rovers that were supposed to be used for the Constellation missions that were going to take us back to the moon and extend our reach after that off into deeper space and maybe head to Mars. You could see there a jetpack unit for doing EVAs, few monitors and stuff. We're going to continue working our way through. There's that jetpack. 
a nice close look there. You just kind of back into that and you got all the controls for maneuvering around. And now here we are looking at those rovers. This is the back corner of the building where you can see that there's a lot of stuff that really isn't accessible to the public generally. But we're behind the scenes so we get to see good close up views of these things. One really cool thing about one of these rovers that's coming up real soon is it was designed where the astronauts would not have to actually exit the rover in order to go out and walk around on the surface. The way it worked is once they were in there, the spacesuits that they would use to do their EVAs were attached to the back of the rover. So all they would have to do is go from the spacecraft here, from the rover, go to the back, slide themselves into the spacesuit still inside and then just close off the back of it as if it were another craft and walk away and then when they come back they just back themselves up there you can see a view of it right there they just back themselves up to the rover and slide themselves back into the cabin now what that meant was they never had to bring any of that dust from outside back inside that rover so they didn't have to breathe it in or anything like that and it wouldn't get inside and contaminate anything that was inside because apparently when they went to the moon and they just went out on their EVAs and opened up the door and came back inside and went back out and in stuff dust would come in with them on their clothes of course and that stuff is like little bits of glass it, at the way that it's so sharp and it smelled horrible i read something about one of the astronauts said that that stuff just smell absolutely horrible and it would cut their lungs up a little bit when they would breathe it in because it was so tiny and so sharp basically it created like a, a short-term version of black lung you just be coughing all the time so anyway we've moved now off into another building we're moving out through the back of this one and we're going to go outside here soon but i noticed that all along the entire way there's all these pictures of everybody who's been in space everybody who's gone and all their missions and pictures of them and everything like that and then i go back to filming all the different spacesuits that have been used throughout the years we went from mercury and gemini up into apollo into space shuttle suits you have suits for walking on the surface and suits for going eva suits for launching suits for landing with there's suits 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 and all these different types throughout the years and then in a moment here I'm going to come up to a board that's right by the exit door and on that board they list in order all of the layers of the different suits which is really really cool to see just how many layers there are and what all those layers are, are doing like some of them are stopping debris uh, if they get hit by little micrometeors it's like a Kevlar sort of thing that just prevents the debris from going in penetrating and damaging them there's layers for containing the oxygen so nothing goes in and out just completely airtight there's layers for doing cooling there's all things like in a moment here you're gonna see it and there it is you can see the EMU material layers take a look at those look at all these things and you could feel them you see there was little bits of them and I could reach out and just feel what each of them was like you know some of them are rubbery some of them are like mesh and now we've moved outside we have to head across the campus to another location and look they have Turtles wow. coming over to us. Maybe it gets fed. They're like, hey, where's my bread? Nah, we don't have bread here. Yep, that's a turtle who came over looking to see if we had food. Apparently they feed the turtles too. Okay, so we have now moved across the campus to another building, and in the lobby of this building, they have SST2. I guess it's a trainer, space shuttle trainer number two. This is the mission control lobby here. We've just come in. Naturally, they have to have videos on the wall where they're showing you how to pee in space, because I guess that's the number one question that gets asked all the time, is how do you pee in space? Why that's so fascinating, I have no idea. And then we move upstairs. We are now in the hall where we are going to see what this used to look like. See those cows there? And this field, that's what was here before they built Mission Control. That's what it looked like. They bought the land from a farmer and they built it out. My daughter took a little bit of time here to pretend there was a hopscotch 
path right along there. Okay, well anyway, now we got to move into the back room of Mission Control. This is where they keep an eye on the ISS. There aren't that many people in here right now. This would be full with people if this were a an important time, like they were docking a ship or something like that. Right now, it was a quiet time. It was actually... Uh, an hour away from the sleep cycle of the astronauts. It was just over an hour. You can see way at the top of the screen, right there in the middle, it indicated when their sleep time was going to be. I took more footage of me in there, but I've cut it out because later we actually get to go inside. Now we are in the old Apollo and Space Shuttle Control Center. I'm the mission director now. Here we go, we're gonna push some buttons. Everything. Oh no, red light everywhere. <laughs> well, I think from that you can tell that if I had been in charge, Apollo 13 might not have made it back. So I put my daughter in charge. She's now in the mission director's seat. Notice the plexiglass back there. If you are a normal visitor, that's where you have to sit. We are in here because Jason had special access. And so my family and I, we were all in here, moving around to all the different stations, sitting down, flipping switches, seeing what it would have been like. This is that mission control center where Apollo 13 was brought home from. Uh, the Originally, when they were going to do the movie for that, they wanted to come in here and film it right in this room. But as it turned out, NASA didn't want them to actually smoke in here and that was something they wanted to do in the movie for authenticity so instead they were allowed to come in measure it all out and they made a replica and then they filmed Apollo 13 in that replica of this room but still it's pretty cool that they had such a good replica because the room is still up and standing and I must stress again how awesome it is to be in here when you're looking through that plexiglass at all the other visitors who have to do the normal tour. It really was awesome just being in here and doing this stuff by hand myself. So now Jason is leading me and my family down the hall to the actual mission control where they have their attitude control device right there. This is the room that I showed earlier where we were up behind the plexiglass, but I said to you, oh, I have some shots from down inside it because I didn't know that I was actually going to go inside it later. And uh, therefore I've took out a little bit of that and I put in a little extra time in this section. You can see this is Jason's actual section right here. This is where he sits when he's working. All these screens manage ISS information. There's data coming down constantly. And here I am blowing things up again. Who let this guy in here? That's going to be pretty cool. So now I'm moving out to the front of the room where we can point the camera up here at the screens that let them track what's going on with the ISS. You can see its paths there where it's going to go in the near future. And those big circles, uh, like the green one in the middle and there's some teal ones and the yellow one, those represent the communications ranges of the Tedris satellites. Some of the smaller circles represented where the communications would be on the ground. They have three Tedrises, though, that allow them to keep in constant communication. And there's the pink one. That's the one that they need to go out and they were training for that we saw earlier. They need to go out and replace that. Then we go down the hall to new mission control. This is actually the third one, I guess. Not a lot was going on there, so we kind of skipped over that one and headed off now to the rocket park. And the rocket park contains, you saw over on the right there, some uh, smaller spacecraft, but inside they have a Saturn V. Gigantic. The capsule at the front here had actually seen some weather because it had been outside and they restored all the rest of the parts of this craft. It never got launched, but that capsule there, that still had not been uh, restored to its glorious look of the, the nice whites and black sheens of all the rest of it. There were little walkways that allowed me to go up in between and see where things like the LEM would sit inside here. And around that edge right there is the avionics ring that's in between the sections of the stages here. Then I swing around and we get to take a look at the other side. Now this is the top of the third stage fuel tank in there where they would be storing some of that liquid hydrogen, I assume. And then moving back here, we are looking at the single engine of stage three. 
That's a Rocketdyne J2. You can see on the outside there some attitude control devices and those little spheres where they'd contain the compressed helium that allow them to repressurize those gas tanks up there, as well as that white round sphere there that contains the hypergolic fluid for the engine restart that they would need in order to get themselves going toward the moon if this had been a real launch. Look at all those wonderful little pipes and tubes and passageways. You can see the engine bell there with the way that the exhaust, see those little ribs? The exhaust would come out through there allowing the exhaust itself to help cool down the engine and absorb some of the heat, protecting that engine bell from the extreme heat of the combustion that would otherwise melt it. Now we've moved back to the bottom here of the uh, second stage. Now these are the exact same engines, except this one has five of them. So theoretically, there would be 5,000 kilonewtons of thrust, although technically, because they'd be lower in the atmosphere when that one fired off, it might not be exactly 5,000 right at the beginning. It'd probably be more like 4,400 or so, but it would increase as they go higher into the atmosphere, thus the pressure of the atmosphere would be reduced, allowing the expansion of the gases and higher velocities and higher efficiency. Pretty cool looking assembly right there if you ask me. Now we'll slip past that interstage and walk toward the back here where my daughter is waiting to show us the engine bell of the Rocketdyne F1. That thing is massive. And they have five of those, of course. Now those should be providing about 6,600, 6,700 thrust at the engine ignition, but that's going to increase as it goes higher into the atmosphere. It starts off with a lower ISP, probably around 263, and then that's going to increase. By the time they shut those engines down, my guess is it's probably somewhere around 304, and therefore the actual thrust by that point will be 78, 25 kilonewtons per engine. Now you might be thinking, wow, that's close to 40,000 kilonewtons by the time they actually shut down. Well, that's not actually true because they shut the middle engine down early and that allows the last four to keep a slightly lower thrust to weight ratio and not increase the G forces too considerably. So therefore, when it finally shuts down, it's probably around 31,000 uh, 31, kilonewtons of thrust. And you can see we're moving now outside through some of those ones we saw at the beginning all these little engines, well, they're not really little, but they're certainly little compared to the Rocketdyne F1. So we can see here some of these other ones that were used for the smaller rockets. We could see a Gemini rocket over there and a red, the Redstone, the gantry way that they would walk on to go out to the rockets in order to board them. That was over on the ground there for a second. So really cool view here of all these different sizes compared to the, some of the stuff that we saw inside. I mean, well, that's it for the Rocket Park. We're now going to move to the Space Center in Houston here, where they have, and I beeline straight for it, an NCC-1701 shuttlecraft. This was actually used in making some of the episodes of Star Trek, which was a couple years before my time. They had canceled it a bit before I was born, but you better believe that when I was a little older and it was being syndicated, I was watching it religiously. Took a little peek here in the back to see what they actually did for some of those controls to make it look a little more authentic, and then moved over here, handed over the camera to my daughter who wanted to take a little look at that spacesuit and Orland suit. I've talked about that before in Project Gateway, and then we see she's testing out some of the activities activities you can do here where they spin you around and see how well you can operate controls while you're being disoriented. Shifting over here next to one of the space shuttles, we can see one of the space shuttle engines. Built once again by Rocketdyne, this is the RS-25 engine, and it has somewhere around 2,000 kilonewtons of thrust, give or take a couple hundred, based on altitude, sea level, vacuum, throttle control, that sort of thing. And there we have our LEM and various other things that you can see as we pan across the entirety of the visitor center here. I'm just going to move the camera along and show all the different stuff that you can see and do 
do. There's activities in the center. There's exhibits around the outside edges. There's movies you can go see. There's a, another little museum of old artifacts like this actual fuel cell from one of the command modules that would have gone to the moon, although this one didn't, of course, because those don't come back. What does come back is me! I came back. After this, we were out of there and back to the hotel, to the airport, off to our trip into the Caribbean, and then home again, where now I can continue working on my real solar system launch, which you can see right here. And I'm also thinking that this might be my next real solar system project, if you know what that is, and I certainly hope you do just by looking at it. And then after that, we'll be moving back into continuing, well, not really after that coincidental with that I'm going to work on both at the same time if I can we'll be going back into Project Odyssey which you can see the intro right here so until then I will see you later Kerbinauts